Circe's Palace, Part 6, from the Tanglewood Tales. As for yourself, valiant sir, said Circe, judging by the dignity of your aspect, I take you to be nothing less than a king. Deign to follow me, and you shall be treated as befits your rank. So Ulysses followed her into the Oval Salon, where his two and twenty comrades had devoured the banquet which ended so disastrously for themselves. But all this while, he had held the snow-white flower in his hand and had constantly smelt of it while Circe was speaking. And as he crossed the threshold of the salon, he took good care to inhale several long and deep snuffs of its fragrance. Instead of two and twenty thrones, which had been arranged around the wall, there was now only a single throne in the center of the apartment. But this was surely the most magnificent seat that ever a king or an emperor reposed himself upon, all made of chased gold, studded with precious stones, with a cushion that looked like a soft heap of living roses, and overhung by a canopy of sunlight, which Circe knew how to weave into the drapery. The enchantress took Ulysses by the hand and made him sit down upon the dazzling throne. Then, clapping her hands, she summoned the chief butler. Bring hither, said she, the goblet that is set apart for kings to drink out of, and fill it with the same delicious wine which my royal brother, King Aetes, praised so highly when he last visited me with my fair daughter, Medea. That good and amiable child. Were she now here, it would delight her to see me offering this wine to my honored guest. But Ulysses, while the butler was gone for the wine, held the snow white flower to his nose. Is it a wholesome wine? asked he. At this, the four maidens tittered, whereupon the enchantress looked around at them with an aspect of severity. It is the wholesomest juice that ever was squeezed out of the grape, said she, for instead of disguising a man as other liquors is apt to do, it brings him to his true self and shows him as he ought to be. The chief butler liked nothing better than to see people turned into swine or making any kind of beast of themselves. So he made haste to bring the royal goblet filled with a liquid as bright as gold and which kept sparkling upward and throwing a sunny spray over the brim. But delightfully as the wine looked, it was mingled with the most potent enchantments that Circe knew how to concoct. For every drop of the pure grape juice, there were two drops of the pure mischief. And the danger of the thing was, the mischief made it taste all the better. The mere smell of the bubbles, which effervesced at the brim, was enough to turn a man's beard into pig's bristles, or make a lion's claws grow out of his fingers or a fox's brush behind him. Drink, my noble guest, said Circe, smiling as she presented him with the goblet. You will find in this draught a solace for all your troubles. King Ulysses took the goblet with his right hand, while with his left he held the snow-white flower to his nostrils and drew in so long a breath that his lungs were quite filled with its pure and simple fragrance. Then drinking off all the wine, he looked the enchantress calmly in the face. Wretch, cried Circe, giving him a smart stroke with her wand. How dare you keep your human shape a moment longer? Take the form of the brute whom you must resemble. If a hog, go join your fellow swine in the sty. If a lion, a wolf, or a tiger, go howl with the beasts on the lawn. If a fox, go exercise your craft in stealing poultry. Thou hast quaffed all my wine, and canst be man no longer. But such was the virtue of the snow-white flower. Instead of wallowing down from his throne in swinish shape, or taking any other brutal form, Ulysses looked even more manly and king-like than before. He gave the magic goblet a toss and sent it clashing over the marble floor to the farthest end of the salon. Then drawing his sword, he seized the enchantress by her beautiful ringlets 
and made a gesture as if he meant to strike off her head at one blow. Wicked Circe, cried he in a terrible voice, this sword shall put an end to thy enchantments. Thou shalt die, vile wretch, and do no more mischief in the world by tempting human beings into the vices which make beasts of them. The tone and countenance of Ulysses was so awful, and his sword gleamed so brightly, and seemed to have so intolerably keen an edge, that Circe was almost killed by the mere fright without waiting for a blow. The chief butler scrambled out of the salon, picking up the golden goblet as he went, and the enchantress and the four maidens fell on their knees, wringing their hands and screaming for mercy. Spare me, cried Circe, spare me, royal and wise Ulysses, for now I know that thou art he of whom Quicksilver forewarned me, the most prudent of mortals against whom no enchantments can prevail. Thou only couldst have conquered Circe. Spare me, wisest of men. I will show thee true hospitality and even give myself to be thy slave and this magnificent palace to be henceforth thy home. The four nymphs, meanwhile, were making a most piteous ado, and especially the ocean nymph with the sea green hair wept a great deal of salt water, and the fountain nymph, besides scattering dewdrops from her finger ends, nearly melted away into tears. But Ulysses would not be pacified until Circe had taken a solemn oath to change back his companions and as many others as he should direct from their present forms of beast or bird into their former shapes of men. On these conditions, said he, I consent to spare your life. Otherwise, you must die upon the spot. With a drawn sword hanging over her, the enchantress would readily have consented to do as much good as she had hitherto done mischief, however little she might like such employment. She therefore led Ulysses out of the back entrance of the palace and showed him the swine in the sty. There were about fifty of these unclean beasts in the whole herd, and though the greater part were hogs by birth and education, there was wonderfully little difference to be seen betwixt them and their new brethren who had so recently worn the human shape. To speak critically, indeed, the lather rather carried the thing to excess and seemed to make it a point to wallow in the mirest part of the sty and otherwise to outdo the original swine in their own natural vocation. When men once turn to brutes, the trifle of man's wit that remains in them adds tenfold to their brutality. The comrades of Ulysses, however, had not quite lost the remembrance of having formerly stood erect. When he approached the sty, two and twenty enormous swine separated themselves from the herd and scampered toward him with such a chorus of horrible squealing as made him clap both hands to his ears. And yet, they did not seem to know what they wanted, nor whether they were merely hungry or miserable from some other cause. It was curious in the midst of their distress to observe them thrusting their noses into the mire in quest of something to eat. The nymph with the bodice of oak and bark, she was the hamadryad of oak, threw a handful of acorns among them, and the two and twenty hogs scrambled and fought for the prize as if they had tasted not so much as a noggin of sour milk for twelve months. These must be my comrades, said Ulysses. I recognize their dispositions. They are hardly worth the trouble of changing them into human form again. Nevertheless, we will have it done, lest their bad example should corrupt the other hogs. Let them take their original shapes, therefore, Dame Circe, if your skill is equal to the task. It will require greater magic, I trow, than it did to make swine of them. So Circe waved her wand again and repeated a few magic words, at the sound of which the two and twenty hogs pricked up their pendulous ears. It was a wonder to behold how their snouts grew shorter and shorter, and their mouths, which they seemed to be sorry for because they could not gobble so expediently, smaller and smaller and how one and another began to stand upon his hind legs and scratch his nose with his fore-trotter. 
At first, the spectators hardly knew whether to call them hogs or men, because by and by it came to conclusion that they rather resembled the latter. Finally, there stood the 22 comrades of Ulysses, looking pretty much the same as when they left the vessel. You must not imagine, however, that the swinish quality had entirely gone out of them. When once it fastens itself into a person's character, it is very difficult getting rid of it. This was proved by the hammer dryad who, being exceedingly fond of mischief, threw another handful of acorns before the 22 newly restored people whereupon they wallowed in a moment and gobbled them up in a very shameful way. Then, recollecting themselves, they scrambled to their feet and looked more than commonly foolish. Thanks, noble Ulysses, they cried. From brute beast you have restored us to the condition of men again. Do not put yourselves to the trouble of thanking me, said the wise king. I fear I have done but little for you. To say the truth, there was a suspicious kind of grunt in their voices, and for a long time afterwards, they spoke gruffly and were apt to set up a squeal. And we're starting to run a little long here, so we'll pause now and continue with this story in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've clicked like and subscribe, and I hope you leave a comment. Love to hear from you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Bye-bye.